Hello, my name is Stuart McLean, and I would like to welcome you to the to this first episode of my vlog, I guess. Um, why should you be listening to me, this random stranger on an, in the internet? Well, I'll show you. E oh, where to begin? Where to begin? Well, firstly, should be I should uh, introduce myself. Of course, as I said, I'm Stuart McLean, and I'm the progenitor of the Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis, which is quite an introduction when you try and think about it, and uh, we actually introduce it as to people like it doesn't really have the best effect but here let me show you an idea that no one has ever thought about I mean if people had thought about it then I shouldn't uh, be able to have done this namely here is my hypothesis the Big Bang Kill no hypothesis ranking first, second, third, fourth, and it is exactly what it says on the tin, in that it is a hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis, about the nature of the Big Bang, which is the story of creation as told by physicists and cosmologists and by science, and at its heart it uses a kilniver for its explanation. So. I want to show you what my website has. If we go to it, uh, and as I essentially uh, show you around, show you around. So, why should you be listening to me uh, about about this stuff? Well, as I said, I'm also the first person to try and think about a particular idea from a particular kind of way. So, the first thing I like like to introduce you to is, is if I can find it. Ah, there it is. The expansion of space time. So, so in order to communicate my idea, I've been making films about it, and this series of vlogs is essentially me. Making the next series is about me actually making the next film in my series. And as I was going through my script, I'm looking at it and going, this is going to take quite a lot of time to explain, or the explanation I'm putting into my film is really very, very, very dense and very complicated. I'm using a lot of big words, and, and those words have meaning, meaning within the context of physics and cosmology, you know, the particular words that are used to talk about specific things. And, and it's the best choice of my words, but I'm realizing I'm, I'm gonna to have to explain it again and again and again and again. So I might as well get used to that. And so I'll, so this is what I, this is all about. Um, Talk about the Big Bang. I've got, I've got this. Uh, my first one of my first films is called the the expansion of space time, and it explores the in, the history of the Big Bang theory itself, not my hypothesis, but the context of, in which my hypothesis fits. So, I talk about the talk about how. Astronomers looking out into the universe, how they ex see the expansion of, of the universe, namely they see galaxies moving away, and this started with George Lemaitre and Ed Edwin Hubble, and and then uh, physicists, then other, well, George Lemaitre actually cre created a me created a, solu a cosmological solution to Einstein's equations of the general relativity and put together this idea that that as the galaxies are moving apart 
then if you rewind the clock, they all come back and call back and they all converge on a single a single space. And that's how the Big Bang Theory, the idea of it, was born. So I talk about the expansion of space-time and spectrography, which, which, uh, which essentially shows... So here we've got, like, uh, I'm showing the... demonstrating the redshift and the concept of it. Um, and yeah, I would have essentially... Have, uh, essentially that, that is one of my first, one of my first main films. Um, it's a great project. Uh, got to do a lot of 3D rendering and visualizing. And as this is my hypothesis, I'm the best person to actually draw the art for the hypothesis. I've got a particular vision in my mind and I'm wanting to put it onto, put it onto screen. And so this is my first exercise in it. But my actual hypothesis itself, um, to get to it, is in this particular film. Now, I've got this link here in my latest podcast. If I click on that. This is the work I did at the end of last year, um, in which I laid out my entire entire hypothesis from end to end, the co whole context, uh, and the, so if we have a look at the, the image here, well, this is the image itself for it. In the, in the top, uh, in the top, top left, We've got we've got the ESA's uh, play, blank uh, microwave background radiation map, and it's mapped onto a sphere sphere such we can view it uh, uh, as such we can actually rotate and view it around. And if I go back to my main page, I'm just loading up these. So show you that this is actually the Planck satellite. If I go to the ESA page, it is this image here that's been projected onto a Molly Weld uh, sphere. Uh, and I can spin it around and view it. And if we look at it from the South Pole, We've got this hot spot here and the spiral which rotates out around here. And then in the cold spot, we've got the cold spot and this cold spiral that moves around here and up and up. So it spirals around the South Pole, essentially. And if we look at it here, so this is a, what's called a best fit model um, that, that is best fit to the WMAP da data of a large scale anisotropy so you can actually see them much more clearly as, po as opposed to all the other, all the other details. So this is, so essentially, so essentially this is like it's been put through a bandpass filter. Uh, this is the this is a long frequency wavelengths of large scale anisotropies in a high resolution map. This particular map is W map. This particular this is the actual as as, as we've seen is uh, coming from the Planck Commission. And so so we've got. As, as I said, we've got a cold spot, and it's a recognized feature as being the CMB cold, cold spot. And it spirals around here. We've got a cold spiral, and then we've got a hot spiral. It's as if two bodies were coming in on each other, and waves were rippling out. Hmm. It's almost as if there's gravitational waves coming out of it. 
namely this is why I've got justification for the big bang killing over or that's my straight or that that's the primary evidence it's not the only bit of evidence is so much so 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 much and it, and I, and in this film here uh, my big bang killing of hypothesis pod, podcast two and so if you just go into google it would just go big bang killing over here it is listed on youtube hello and welcome to the big so it's it's quite long uh, in the first uh, so in the first half oh if I go back to my page so in the first half of the fil film I introduce the whole concept of what I've come to call the superverse and the subverse and what I say the original idea as I put it is to say fractal geometry is the cosmological principle and thus self-similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale so essentially I'm framing my argument in the mathematical terms from from the start and secondly I have to make an assumption about the Big Bang there's only one Big Bang we can't recreate it in the lab we've got the primary evidence of it which is the microwave sky so we've got to make an uh, we've got to make an assumption the simpler the less number of assumptions that there are the well the less number of assumptions there are and the simpler those assumptions are the better you're looking for the simplest possible explanation so i just say fractal geometry is the cosmological principle in turn then we've actually got the real the what's called the standard mo what's called the land of cdm's um cosmological principle or what and land of cdm is called the standard model of cosmology which is based on inflation theory so the land of cdm models uh it, it says that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic when viewed on a large enough scale usually about two, that large enough scale is 250 million light years or 300 to 330 million light years i see it keep, it keep there's another bound that i keep seeing new new figures for as they find larger voids which uh it's fortunate for me in fact that we'll come on to that in a bit but for me, I I start start off by pointing us out, pointing this thing out <clears throat> about the micro sky, and then I fr and then I begin my argument by framing by framing it in the context of general relativity. So in saying fractal geometry is a cosmological principle, self similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale. So. Essentially, that means I'm looking for something inside this universe that I can study in order to tell me what the pattern of the Big Bang was. And at the heart of the Big Bang theory is what's called the singularity. Everything crushes everything that's in the entire universe, all coming back in time and crushes, becomes a big hot ball plasma and then crushes down to a single tiny point of infinite density and curvature this is called the point singularity well um the big bang theory involves the birth or i make the assumption that a point singularity is bo born so i'm looking at the, i'm looking to study the birth of unknown gravitational singularity in the context of general relativity inside our universe and that means the birth of a black hole. Now, there are two ways a black hole can be born. Not, I'm just excluding black hole, existing black holes merging with something. But, eh, but essentially, um, 
I'm wanting to study the birth of a known gravitational singularity, a black hole that is born into existence. Because as our universe is born, so too is a black hole born. So I'm studying the mechanisms by which a black hole is born. And there's two types, a core collapse supernova, or as I call it, a hypernova for very specific reasons. To, because I'm, well, to see that I, I've got, a, I've got a, an essay call, called essay here, what is a hypernova? I essentially explain what a core collapse supernova is and then study the pattern of that in order to build, build my hypothesis. I'm, so I'm essentially looking to nature to tell me how is the universe born rather than assuming, making lots of assumptions and trying to invent say 11 dimensions and like string theory does. I'm wanting to study nature and let nature tell me what what the pattern is and it's and that and that's how it start, started out i started out by calling it the big bang hypernova hypothesis because that was my primary mechanism but because of the large scale anisotropies as i showed you it's a killer nova so i've reframed my hypothesis in terms of terms of a killer nova but in terms of general in framing in terms of general relativity i start i start off in my discussion by looking at the Kerr metric where where rotation is in play because from because as, as, as we'll i'll walk you back through through my work uh, as we go here as i've got uh but i realized the important the importance that rotation plays in the formation of a hypernova in the creation of long gamma ray bursts and then and then i looked at general relativity and rotation which is a specifically looking in, in the context of the Kerr metric although mo more modernly i'm looking at it in the terms of um nicholas popol popolonski i think it is his name it's po polish polish uh, theoretical physicist who's who's got who's got the closest mathematical description to what I, I am trying to say. And, and effectively, he, he's, he's framed the whole context of how, uh, how the universe can be born in, term, in terms of a cosmological metric, in terms of what's called the FLWR, the friedman lamatra walker robertson metric. Wait. Cosmological and local metric are, uh, when I say these words, the, these are solutions to general relativity that, that people have fa found over the years. Sometimes the solutions are named after the people who found them, like uh, the FLWR, Free Friedman, Lamatra, Adam George Lamatra, the guy who started the Big Bang Theory, well, Walker and Robertson. Friedman was the first person to come up if I remember right and it describes the it describes a homogeneous and isotropic the expansion of a homogeneous and isotropic universe and the reason the homogeneous and isotropic universe is the cosmological principle is because if I look point a telescope out into the sky and look in one direction to the far end of the universe i see galaxies i see stars i see we see the spectral pattern the, uh, we see the light from the stars and when we split it through a prism we see a, we get us well we get the spectral path we get the spectral pattern so if i go back to my open up another tab for that we get the spectral pattern and we can tell, we can tell from the li lines in it that it's got atoms in it. And so essentially we know that, that over, that on one side of the galaxy, one, one side of the universe, I mean, uh, we see the laws of physics operating the same way we do here on Earth. And if we point the telescope to, in the other direction, to the other far side of the galaxy, we see the exact same picture. And over and over and over again, we're seeing the same picture. 
this picture of a mostly homogeneous and isotropic universe. I say mostly because we've got large voids like Boerties. We'll come to that in a bit. <laughs> that's where I, uh, that's where I, that's where inflation theory falls down from observed observations. It gets deep, very deep. But yeah, so going down the rabbit hole right here, I go, I go, I, I describe the whole context of how a universe can, gives birth to a black hole, which in turn goes through a wormhole, which is surrounded by not a point singularity, but what's known as a ringularity, a ring of infinite curvature. And through this ring is a wormhole. This wormhole in turn leads to the reverse time solution of a black hole, which is a theoretical white hole. And because there's only one white hole for every, for every universe, one that gives birth to it, this white hole gives birth to either two subverses or or if it's in a superverse, it's giving birth to, say, like our universe and our parallel universe of antimatter. So, in in context, the context of CPT symmetry and the bear, what's called the bearing asymmetry problem, where whereas matter and matter created in equal amounts, my solution is, is to say, here, I go, I go, one universe is one made of matter, the other one. It's going in the other direction is made of an antimatter, and there's this whole thing about. Um, I'll show show you what's called an astrophysical jet. This is what really started me thinking about about this whole process. It was as a solution to the whole matter and antimatter matter problem. Astrophysical jet. This is my rendition of, of one where a in, in the middle of a hypernova where the where it's being born, two jets go go off in power in opposite directions. So because one's going one way and the other one's going the other way in a CPT symmetric pattern, that that was a primary motivation for looking at that and I'm not the only person to probably who's been saying that. I've, I'm finding that's a very common uh, that's a very common interp interpretation. So, um, was it Jean Luc P Petit? Jean Luc Petit. I think it was. Uh, Sakharov star started it. So yeah, here's another. Here, here's the film where I actually explain it. <laughs> um, but that 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 was uh, that was the primary mo that was like a primary motivation into thinking about this is taking. I've been thinking about this for about six seven years now. Um, so I built built up quite quite a number of arguments along the way and. I'm finding, and I'm constantly finding that, that that other people are saying very similar things. It was almost like if the Big Bang Kilanova hypothesis is a superset of quite a lot of cosmological ideas. One of those cosmological ideas stems from Sakharov. Um, Here I uh, actually give a full, give a nice, give a nice simple proof of of CPT symmet of the of this type of symmetry being CPT symmetric, if thought about, if thought about in terms of uh, particles spinning away. So yeah, um, but frame but framing it in context of general relativity, that's how that's how I'm. I talk about how I fra frame it, and here, here we got any. 
This is um, yes, uh, John Pierre Petit and Julian Barber. Um, so they're they're co cosmological mo models of Bill built up. So Sakharov is starting off by proposing this, and this is how I'm propo proposing it. But here's the twist. I'm going with something called an embedded wormhole. Usually, when when you think of a wormhole, it's going, it's going through something. It's going to another universe. It's going to another another place where our universe doesn't 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 exist. The whole idea of the of a black hole, as it was conceived by Roger Penrose, back in 1963. Um, I think right yeah, about that time. Uh, well, it was ba based on the idea of entrapped surfaces, entrapped surfaces of uh, space time. So let me enlarge this up a wee bit. So it's based on the, the idea of entrapped surfaces of space time. And in the context of talking about our universe as being entrapped. I link to a particular pa paper um, showing that, that, that according to the microwave background radiation from the Planck satellite that uh, looks like it's probably closed but at the same time flat basically. But, need to, but it's the concept of the entrapped wormhole. That wormhole's not going anywhere. It's staying in the same location. So Effect, effectively, what I, I'm trying to say say is, our universe is is being inflated into the larger superverse. Now, how do we think about the superverse? Let me introduce you to Boites. The Boites super void is uh, is a void that is is three hundred and thirty. 330 million light years in diameter. You can fit 3,000 Milky Way galaxies from end, end to end. If you start here and fit it all across here, this is how it appears in the night sky. The stars in front of it are star stars, so that so it's showing showing you the location in the night sky of where it is occupied, and here. Here's like the radar of it and a an arti an artistic Im image of it. Coming back to the idea of an, an trap trap wormhole, um, yeah, I essentially tried to in this first film try to explain the whole concept of the superverse and how it surrounds us our universe is inflating into it um and dark energy as we know it is that mass energy density that doesn't belong to our universe but around which our universe is flowing so so we've got two opposing f so here's a where where i could produce a high testable hypothesis Essentially, I, I use a balloon analogy. It's like blowing up a balloon balloon inside inside a room. The balloon, the room already exists before I blow up the balloon. But yeah, so I mean, I mean, for for the balloon, for me to be able to blow the balloon up inside the room, I have to be inside the room to be able to blow up the room, and the room has to exist before. So the superverse as I put it, is like exactly like our universe, but much, 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 much bigger. Here is a star of a superverse, this massive bubble of dark energy around which our universe is flowing rather than it, rather than the, in which the, the Lambda CDM model's interpretation of which is to say, we start off a homogeneous and isotropic matter and and because of infla inflation um, and the va vacuum energy caused by inflation, these bubbles of anti-gravity um, form like soap bubbles 
and so it expands like a um like a like a bubble on a loaf of bread bread that's being cooked the bubble expand bubble you mix the dough you put put the dough into the microwave and the bread rises but bubbles form inside it and the and like and like um bubbles in our and these bubbles inside our universe grow and grow and grow like soap bubbles or like a, or or more specifically like like a like how a like how a pocket of air grows inside grows inside a loaf of bread as it as it is being baked it moves out in all directions whereas i'm saying it flows around it we should be finding our universe flowing around it rather than expanding away from it. So, I want to show you this map here by Brent R. R. Tully. Because, although I don't have a map of the Boartes Void and, and galaxies, either expanding away from it in equal direction or whether galaxies are flowing around it well we do have what we do have the local great void that is on the other side of the milky way Here, here's the milky way here this is the local group and on the other side of the milky way hidden, really kind of hidden for us from us for quite a long time we we have this huge huge local void that is I think it's like let, let's just look local void so look yeah so this is done by Brent Brent Tully this that's where this Im image is coming coming from and this is him map mapping the flow of galaxies around the local void now, people think that this is happening because of a phenomenon called dark flow, but I'm saying no, it flows around it, and this is me showing, showing you that, look, our galaxies flow around it, there, here's a prime evidence. So, I've been testing my hypothesis, and it, that's just, that's just one foundation stone. <laughs> it's... It's a, uh, it's been a scary thing. It's been a very, very scary thing. I'll tell you that. Uh, it's uh, yeah, my whole, the whole story of it is this website, and my ability to try and communicate it. So, so I've, I've been busy. Locked my, locked myself away for six years, and I've been forging something that is. That's something I never thought I'd ever do. <laughs> of course, I want to try and explain explain more about where it comes from. Uh, so, I talk about another one, another cosmological model here. Uh, it's called the Big Crunch. The black hole, black hole crunches everything down. It it compacts the space time down to small things. The idea of the Big Crunch comes from the idea of like you've got a reverse hour of time or you've got the same hour of time that goes from this universe that carries on to, into our universe so here's the universe uh, the universe beforehand in terms of so this is Jean-Pierre Petit's uh, and Julian Barber's more sort of more cosmological model um uh, although no uh so this is Jean-Pierre Petit's particular model Julian Barber is more is more kind of like trying to look at this look at this but without without having to invoke a singularity <clears throat> I invoke a ringularity but in terms of uh, in terms of Poplomsky's work it, he uses the torsion metric particular Einstein Cartan formulation to uh, the torsion metric and that stops the ringularity from collapsing down to infinity it's like a degenerate pressure within it within the ringularity 
that stops it collapsing down. So that's my way of stopping, stopping, getting around, getting around the sing, an in, a point of infinite curvature because the you know, equations break down and everything. So we need to be we're, we're, the for, for a full description. Removing that sing that the singularity from the singularity or the ring or removing the ring for our ring ringularity from the ringularity is a way is the mathematical approach that that Julian Barber takes and uh, and uh, I'm and that Nikodem Popolomsky's work and that I'm taking from um, I'm I'm going to build and build upon is is such a description but. In terms of the big crunch as an idea, this is an old old idea. The universe, just as our universe is expanding, so to the you know, the idea is that the universe all comes back together at some point. Point it gets crushed down and then reborn. If I zoom in, if I open this image, this. The cyclic cosmological model is sort of expressed best in, ter in terms of a crunch, big bang, inflate, expansion, then crunch, then it reverse, crunches down, big bang. So it produces a, a cyclic universe, uh, as they say, like a link sausage. Um, with the big Big crunch, yeah. Effectively, the event horizon of a black hole crushes the entire fabric of of the superverse or our, our universe. If it's a black hole in our universe, right, right down. And it's this crunch. It is, it is. It's the mathematics of the big crunch versus and uh, the inflationary multiverse model. That is. So that's. So, uh, yeah. So, Professor Steinhardt's work is about is about saying essentially looking at the big crunch model and saying, look, it has to be a big crunch. It has to be compacted down. And what I'm saying is, well, it's the event horizon of the newly born black hole in the superverse. So that's what's that's what's being crushed down. That's how you get the big crunch. In in, in my model. So, like I say, it got got particular cosmological models like the Big Crunch that is a subset of the Big Bang Kilanova hypothesis. Uh, now I, so I go on, so I, yeah, I, so yeah, I go, go on to explain, explain the, the Penrose di diagram Firstly, for the Schwarzschild solution, which is the simplest solution, then, then I go, go down, then I go down, then I go down in term, terms of talking about how it come, comes about in terms of rotation, the curve metric and the ringularity, and how, how it leads down. Um, uh, so, so essentially linking back back to his particular lecture where Roger Penrose were were talk, talking about this and how and essentially it relate, relates to all what what the twenty twenty Nobel Prize in, in physics was handed out for uh, the, this idea of entrapped surfaces of space time with positive mass. So. That that's essentially the I where where I'm building building my my descrip description up from. Now, of course, I've got my analogy of balloons uh, as I uh, as I was descri describing there. Nobody nobody can be uncheered with a balloon. Winnie the Pooh. I do like that. So I show you a balloon. So like in the superverse, the balloon our our universe get. Our entrapped manifold of space-time gets blown up and, and it inflates up into it. It gets inflated from the subverse into forming a, an entrapped manifold space-time within our universe. Now, here 
we here is where we enter a recursive pattern. So we look at the pattern in terms of a you know a black hole inflate inflating a subverse inside our universe what effectively becomes dark matter because it's entrapped inside this balloon manifold of space-time that that is well the nozzle of the balloon is where the black hole and white hole are are located and so I'm saying how one universe grows inside another and inside another is a recursive argument fractal geometry is the cosmological principle and so I'm using a, a, an argument of recursion and talking about how and talking about how the superverse inflate how our universe inflates inside the universe and, and so let and then I I talk about Fermi bubbles and Sagittarius A and, how, and apply the apply the exact same argument to how I'm building the Big Bang to arguments about black holes inside our universe and what 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 evidence is there for that in, inside our universe well, we've got these two massive formations that we have not seen before they they're seen in the gamma gamma and x-ray that's why they're invisible and they are linked through the north yeah here we are this is how they're linked, nor northern chimney and the southern, southern chimney, and um, through to Sagittarius A. So the, these formations, we're seeing, we're seeing evident, observational evidence that they're linked. And I, I'm saying these are balloon manifolds of dark matter, big balloon manifolds that form halos, that form halos around spiral galaxies. Why, why can't we find a particle of dark matter? Because it's matter entrapped inside its own entrapped manifold of space-time. The physical definition of that is, I, I talk about how, how the like in my latest film, or the film that, I, that, that, the, that we're going to be seeing me develop in, the, in this vlog, in these vlogs, is going to, is going to actually describe how the field gets torn apart, the electromagnetic field gets torn apart, one one universe to, to effectively inflate and form and create. So the electromagnetic field of our universe is essentially being torn apart and it's being inflated to create these two huge balloons of entrapped manifolds of space-time that themselves are entrapped by that themselves are entrapped by the white hole, which is the white hole entrapped by the wormhole, which is entrapped by the black hole, but that's entrapped inside inside the universe as a whole as an inflating balloon. So, with all I said, the, this is so. Yeah, I talk talk about look. We know spiral galaxies how are. Um, Gal gal galaxies as a whole uh, have got these halos of dark matter. Where did they come from? How did they get there? Well, again, that's precisely the prediction that I'm going to be making in the film I'm, I'm, I'm making. Of course, I'm trying to explain what what the con the concept of an atom in our inside our universe the co concept of like a gold the atomic nuclei of a gold atom in from the superverse inside our universe i say is a supermassive black hole and they get in there from the fragmentation from the kilonova and and they and that gets and that and from the very start these super atomic nuclei of the superverse are to us the supermassive black holes around which galaxies, which were the seeds for galaxy formation. This, this is a really interesting image because, because one of the things about the cosmological principle of, of fra fractals is you should see the same pattern again and again and again, irrespective of scale. So 
with the Fermi bubbles, I'm showing you on the scale of the Milky Way galaxy. Here you go. I'm show, showing you on the scale of... Uh, well, it's hard to say if... Certainly that one here and this one here, the, these are... These are show, so the, this image here is the X-ray and Fermi image of the core of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. Big a, a, is located in here, and we've got we've got. I'm looking at the these particular helical helical spiral patterns. I call it I call it the DNA of the Milky Way, and it is like D, DNA. Um, DNA has the uh, is DNA because of this helical spiral pattern. CPT symmetry is CPT symmetry because of this helical spiral pattern. It's the same fractal. It's the same fractal over and over and over again, irrespective of scale, irrespective of scale. And that's going to be, it's a sort of mantra that almost comes out of our mouth. Fractal geometry is the cosmological principle. Therefore, patterns repeat irrespective of scale. And so a lot of my work is trying to find and identify what that pattern is. And it is this spiral pattern that has a particular epicenter. So here it may be pulsars, white newborn newborn stars which show spir spiral astrophysical jet jets, pulsars, white dwarfs, and black holes, of course. In fact, the particular ones here are probably black holes. Some of these are probably um, formation of new newborn stars. But here we see the, I'm trying, so I'm trying to show the, the fractal pattern at scale of the Milky Way, you know, at scale of at the scale of the large-scale anisotropies across the entire observable universe, at the scale of the Milky Way galaxy, at the scale of objects inside our Milky Way galaxy, when we look at the core, um, and then uh, I then show my arguments about how how it, about the void is void, and how dark energy is mass energy density that belongs outside that is not causally connected to our universe but around which our universe flows so effectively it's like it's like if there's an object in, in the way of the balloon being blown blown up the, the surface of the balloon folds around it or rather i say flows around it because specifically because one the fluid the equations that describe a perfect fluid are themselves a solution to the equations of, are themselves a perfect solution of general relativity i think um i do have a i think uh, ma making that statement i do i do have that link to it and so here's that flow around the loop local galaxy group i talk about and then the next thing i do is i talk i talk about hypernovas because where did the neutron star of the superverse come from? I start started off with the hyper the Big Bang hypernova hypothesis because I had a star of the superverse. We have these big concentrations of dark energy around which our galaxy is flowing, or it's certainly flowing around here. If Brent Artelli's uh observation so this is observational data this is not as far as i can tell this is the best observation of the of the flow of galaxies around the local void so our universe so our universe is flowing around this mass of of dark energy that is that is a local void and, and uh, the other thing about all my work, I'm I'm link I'm making reference, I'm making links to all all the papers I'm talking about. So here here's where we actually see the map of of this local void. So 
are some things that we have to come back to. So in going back through through my work, um, I need to come start by going through back through my or, well going back through my work as it is, and then, and then I'll go for forward through it because. There's something really, um, it's, I don't even know where, I don't have the words to describe it. I could just show you it. It's incredible. But I'll, but I'll show you the scientific justification before showing you my artistic uh, inspiration, <laughs> which is complicated. And so here, I, I'm talking about I'm talking about about how how a neutron star spirals in gravitational waves get emitted from it, and how how we see those gravitational waves being being formed and its signature on the entire scope of the universe. Now here, here's where I really start going into the, the into the primary evidence, the microwave background sky, in talking about the large scale anisotropies, because there's an argument that says that this dipole that was first identified by Kobe um, is a local phenomenon. It's it's a Doppler shift effect of our universe that arises from our universe traveling through the mill. Through, of our, of, of, of our well, um, because of our because of the solar system's travel course and journey through the Milky Way galaxy and the Milky Way's galaxy through the universe as a whole, it this Doppler shift effect arises, or that's what the standard explanation is. However. However, we see we see formation of new standing waves and then three standing waves. These particular ones, oh boy, uh, I've, well, I'll leave those to later because that's part of the new film. But what these maps show, so this map that. That's not um, a dipole a thing caused by the Doppler shift. Because what I talk about is, uh, let's find it. Lionel Schmier. Lionel Schmier from a uh, computer science professor at, L at Kansas State University. For, yeah. Cosmic dipole, fine schmear. Ah, multiple alignment. So, in order to disprove the argument of the di dipole, I show a phenomenon, na namely the way way spiral arms of galaxies form. They can either be like anti-clockwise or they could be either clockwise. So there's a binary distinction between anti-clockwise arms and clockwise are arms and so what Shamir has done is looking at this image here this is a computer algorithm which ta takes uh, takes images of uh, spiral gal galaxies so it forms a data set from uh, of gal images, images of spiral arm galaxies, and finds which way they are rotating. So here it's got an anti-clockwise spin. Here it's got a clockwise spin. And his algorithm, eh, this is in, this is him describing how how his alg algorithm works in order to automate the process of finding out whether a given galaxy has spin its spinward spiral arms are clockwise or anti-clockwise. But he produces the, these maps showing the asymmetry, the measurement of asymmetry. And over, over, overall, overall, he fi finds that it's in the overall 
when compa comparing it to when comparing it to um, we find find that the ratio is really really very low. They they they're identical. It's fifty fifty whether whether it's got given a given galaxy has clockwise or anti-clockwise spin but in producing local maps using uh, spherical harmonics it first creates a dipole map for, from this data and then it shows asymmetry so we've got great asymmetry so, so if I zoom in I zoom in on that there so we've got great amount of asymmetry here and we've got a great amount of a asymmetry here and we've got symmetry here so th this is a so if we go back to here so in this I'm showing the, the two, so that's the microwave background sky. And this is a spin with galaxy, and this is a spin with galaxy. So, so essentially what, what, the, what it shows is that this dipole is not a local feature. This is not caused by a Doppler shift. This is something that's happening at the cosmic scale. And I can tell it's a cosmic thing because we're looking at spir looking at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of spiral galaxies, and looking at their and looking at this property of clockwise or anti-clockwise spinward direction, and so we know it's so we know that these are related to the rotation of the universe as a whole. Now, in the context of my hypothesis, the rotation of the universe makes sense because because for, for, firstly. Kilonova spirals in, creates a rotating black hole. The rotating black hole has to give birth to a ringularity, otherwise there's a point singularity. So rotation is so key. It is it is it I guess that's probably my greatest breakthrough is seeing like hypernova's got rotation in it. Right, that that's an important factor. And this is me building the argument up like our universe is rotating as a whole, and so, and effectively, Lionel Schmier is saying, 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 saying that. And then we've got the quadruple maps, and the quadruple maps are lining up. So the quadruple of the CMB, so the quadruple map of the CMB is also a cosmological feature. Of course, the new argument that I'm bringing up is that this is the this is the imprint of the ringularity here, and this whole argument about about gravitons and the Bose-Einstein condensate are a good way of good way of the quantum way of describing a ringularity. It's one way of like trying to describe it, and. But this hexagonal formation is is essentially well. If I take sorry for the dust, dusty du dusty cloth, but say we've got the fabric of the superverse or the fabric of our universe, and we've got and it goes into a rotational black, gets pulled up through a ringularity. The universe is shaped. It has to go through. It has to go through the ringularity, and so it's shaped by the ringularity. And this is the imprint of quantum gravity. Meaning, this is our window into the, into the ringularity itself, into quantum gravity. And it creates a way of testing hypotheses about quantum gravity, given this interpretation. So, super exciting stuff, Ed. Super exciting stuff. And yeah, so I I make this ar argument that these are these large scale anisotropies are linked to the rotation of the universe as a whole. So 
far universe of being a inflated balloon, it just rotates and rotates. Rotates and rotates. So rotation is imparted to it from the very birth. Because Kilonova rotates, pulsar neutron stars also have rotation, relativistic light speed rotation. Now, here's where I take another, another approach. Um, particularly, I, I look at Bianchi, what's called the Bianchi universe, which are types of cosmological models that that try try to model the large scale anisotropies of the microwave sky, and the most successful of these is what's called the Bianchi Seven H model, which is a model that is in rotation, and these are the best fit map models of these are the be best fit maps of their models. This is different variations of the model. Model trying different para different parameter. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to make a pattern the, that the argument that self similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale, and here is the pattern. We just need to learn how to read it, but. Reading, at, reading that same pattern at a cosmological scale. So, let, let's just, let's just find, uh, because Jaffe started it and then McEwen uh, reprodu reproduced it. So this, this is the, f so, their model finds evidence of vorticity and shear at a large angular scale. So this is all about rotation. And, and the argument I'm making is that that is the signature of a white hole. These are the, this is caused by not just... Well, here's one neutron star coming colliding in. Here's the other neutron star coming, coming colliding in. And then you've got you've got the rotation and shear of uh, of the whole stuff being thro thrown out. And so that that's where I kind of like end end it. So like to show to show like look the cosmic microwave background radiation. Has the has these features, and here's the analysis that has been done done against these fe features from the scientific literature, and um, in order to present uh, my case. So uh, as a whole, but as a whole, it's me. Although I've got got it written down here, and we've got lots and lots of link links to all the different papers that I that I'm linking to. I communicate it as hello. I communicate it as as a film, in ter terms of actually actually communi communicating communicating it very visually. So here, the two universes are inflating in it inside the larger superverse galaxies, galaxies and the smaller cosmos are being inflated. Here, here's the rotational black hole, and so and so, and describe describe it all very, very, very carefully, describing the structure of the curve metric and the ringularity. And here it is, the rotational white hole. There. And so yeah, all my own artwork. <laughs> oh, it's been a brilliant project. So, so that that. So that there, podcast two, Big Bang Killer No Hypothesis. That is my, that is me putting my hypothesis in, or that's the current evolution of it. I'm now building the next evolution of it, or, or just like another, it's not like building on top of it, I'm building another, another new argument, a whole new series of arguments that answer the question, why is the universe homogeneous and isotropic? And I get right into that. That I, Of all the questions I've been able to ask with this hypothesis, I'm so 
so pleased with the answer I've got on my on this one. It's just like it's a beautiful structure of a neutron star. Neutrons they all have the same properties, same mass and energy density. They're all exactly the same. Same half integer spin. Exactly the same. So a whole bunch of them in the neutron star. Well, that's a very homogeneous form of matter. But if they're all arranged in, in a crystal lattice, I packed tightly in. Well, that's well, crystal lattice. He's like say a cubic lattice is also known as an isometric crystal lattice, and that gives me homogeneous and isotropic. I love this. I really do. So we'll continue on to the next the next part, which is looking at the various essays. Well, looking at a couple of other films and then the various essays that that built me up in in, in this process. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is is go through my web website, all the all all the various things that I've done, all the various films I made. All the essays are written in uh, start, starting with starting with uh, essentially my first attempt. It's one thing to have the idea; it's another thing to try and communicate it. So, uh, which is what this website is all about. So, back in my archive, I've got got the initial. The initial uh, document that I, that I wrote, wrote um, back in 2017, and essentially I was kind of pointing out that we've got got astrophysical jets coming from black, coming from uh, galaxies. So this is the Hercules galaxy here, with, of different images. A is in, is in visible light, B is X-ray, so, so we've got the galaxy right in here, then we've got the cl cloud of interstellar gas that, that's glowing in the X-ray. And the reason it's glowing in the X-ray is because of these two astrophysical jets. And right at the center, at the center of the galaxy, of course, is the supermassive black hole. And these jets travel parallel opposite directions to each with respect to each other so at the heart of the big bang is a it's what's called the idea of baryogenesis so if you look up barrio it's where it's essential the problem of where did atoms come from but more important, but going beyond that, atoms being made of electrons and protons, protons being made of quarks. Where did they come from? And so, any theory of the Big Bang has got to be able to uh, answer the question, where did all the matter in the universe come from? How was it formed? And so, that that's what uh, bar baryogenesis is all, all about. How did the... How did the... Uh, fundamental particles of physics come into being and then how did those fundamental particles become the atoms in the periodic table but the so so I'm trying so hopefully trying to find an article I linked to in the ESA talking about bar baryogenesis, but here, here we've got the cre creation of matter, which which, uh, which involve, involves gamma rays coming in from each other, and you and you get a, and from which you get an electron and a, well electron here and a positron here. It's called pair production, and then inverse, you got. When an electron and a positron meet, they produce gamma rays that come off at ninety at one hundred and eighty degrees degrees to one another. 
And so I'm looking at this, this reaction, and this reaction, and thinking about it in terms of scale, seeing the same pa pattern here in the, both in the creation of matter and the destruction of matter, and then on the gla black scale in these astrophysical jets. So that, that's what really kind of like motivated me uh, as a way of get, getting into the into this. And then I'm trying to, this is some of my earlier, re, or earlier reasoning, but it's very, very, very naive. It's, I'm more, in many ways, I've, as I've gone through, as, as I've worked through the years, on this, uh, I've been learning lots and lots and lots and lots of physics. <laughs> Try, trying to find anything, anything that can squash or nullify my, my idea. Uh, particularly describe, describe um, the anisotropies, how. Um, Looking, and so I uh, yeah I've got some no, I've got some no, I've got well I've got I had quite I've always had quite a good knowledge of it's just been built up on over and up and up and over the years just through all the various things that I've done. One of the particular now forms of analysis that I did was was uh, looking at the splitting of the fundamental forces. So this is another thing that goes back to the Big Bang, what's called the unification of forces. So in physics. There are, we find that there are four fundamental forces. The first one is gravity. Next one is the electromagnetic force. Next one's the weak nuclear force. And the, and the one below that is the strong nuclear force. Each one operates on a different level of scale. So we've got that thing again, scale. It's always coming back to scale. And, and so it's why I say, Fractal geometry is the cosmological principle, and self-similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale. So we're always looking for the same patterns, be they at the quantum level, the atomic level, molecular level, all, all the way up to solar system, galaxies, supernovas, hypernovas supermassive black holes and then all the way up to the Big Bang and then going beyond that using a recursive argument we say say I say the superverse and then you say the super superverse because the superverse is contained within the superverse it's a recursive argument in there about, about the very nature of reality that's based upon the idea of entrapped, manif entrapped manifolds of space-time But the, one of the main, main reasons that the unification of forces is a prominent subject is because, is because as the temperature scale gets higher and higher, again, scale, and temperature is cold dark matter is cold dark matter, but it's matter inside the subverse. It's the land that I've got the problem with. But the problem that Einstein was trying to deal with to his dying day was this unification of forces. <clears throat> because as the temperature gets higher in, in reactions, the, the forces are combined and unified. So what they do at the LHC is slam, slam protons or slam heavy ions together at, at such great, great energies that it, that it manages to create particles of sufficiently high enough energy that show up these four forces and the and what they find is the weak nuclear force combines with the electromagnetic force and it becomes the weak the electro weak force at this, this point so in here it's the electro weak force and then so that's the Higgs mechanism in there and then we've got the strong nuclear force 
being unified and then ultimately they believe that gravity can be, be unified so it's all coming from a single single source so all splits apart so so it's whole this whole splitting geometry of the splitting apart uh, as it moves away from the time of the big bang is a is kind of very sen is very central to producing any big bang argument any kind of big bang argument and so I look at, at it from a concentric ring point of view in term, terms of actually expressing it as as a computational model everything explodes off from the Big Bang and then using one electromagnetic force I'm able to produce this concentric ringed um, flow here we've got here if I just pause it so the flow has broken apart into a single point and come out come out as it's fa essentially all fanned out of that and this is what I'm des describing here in, the, in this particular artwork so starts a well, cross section here and we have just one force then we have a cross section here sorry then we have a cross section here uh, where we have force of gravity and then then all the other forces combined so we've got two and there then the strong nuclear force breaks apart and then gives us three and the weak and the electromagnetic split apart giving giving us a full series of concentric circles so in in presenting my concentric circle artwork the this was my my, descri my description of 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 the fundamental forces uh, fra fracturing and we get this imprint that Penrose has uh, found sh showing concentric concentric circles being ident identified in the microwave background radiation so here I talk about uh, dark flow so dark flow is the idea is the idea of why our galaxy plus all the other local ga galaxies around us are flowing around the local group but here here I'm saying here I'm more saying it's flowing up from a particular region it's flowing up from the cold spot And the formation of this cold, cold spot here, here, and so here, here's the rotational black hole, and on the other side of that is our universe, which has got the rotational white hole, where our universe is being born in into, and it's breaking apart. apart. On the outside, we've got the gravity, and then on the, and then on the inside, we've got the other various. Layer, layers or fields that pervade all 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 things within it but, uh, but here but this particular but here you've got space opening up between between the source and where everything else is being sort of flo thrown to and so that's what I'm trying to communicate here here in this initial one is how our universe has got a direction and everything in that including ourselves is moving in that direction which which is towards the shape what we call what's called the shapely uh, supercluster when when talking about the idea of of a dark flow and it but the origin of it is 
in the cold, cold spot, in the origin of the cold spot, the reason for the cold spot opening up is because the space has opened up. Again, I go back, go back to my artwork and analysis. Now, this artwork actually plays a very, very important role, and it's let's see. So I'm trying other art, art, artwork to try and look at a sort of concentric model and trying to think about it in terms of particles, Higgs and the Higgs in the very centre, gluons. Then you've got strong you know, strong nuclear force. So trying trying to even pull these universe these separate separate what well, essentially separate vacuum spaces inside our universe apart is very very hard very very hard the glue all the gluons will not allow it it's like as if the photons in our universe weren't allow, allowing our universe from being pulled apart if you tried to pull our universe from the superverse from inside from if you're inside the superverse you try to pull our manifold of space-time you'll get this reaction where of light it's a, I'm sort of saying trying to say the same sort of thing for for inside the universe inside a quark no inside a proton so the universe inside a proton is is surrounded by the quark field and the quark and in there is contained the gluon field and inside that right at the middle is the Higgs field because Higgs has no has zero spin. Then, then we've got the, the weak nuclear force, weak nuclear force occupying the next space with the electrons. So it build, builds up Hig, Higgs in the middle, quark, quarks and gluons. They make protons. That give that makes a half. That makes a protons and neutrons being spin have half integer spins just like electrons have half integer spins and that makes up the atom so it's trying to think about how so here I'm trying to think about the standard model of cosmology in terms of particle physics and how does my model how does this concentric concentric view of the universe build up though it's though I really would say this is not one of my better arguments yet and it's one that's building and building and building but I'm st this is the first attempt I have to say fractal geometry is a cosmological principle and so in thinking about taking a cross section through through our universe so, so if we think a cross section through the jet and what kind of structure we see with within it i will also say that you see the same pattern on the on ga ga gas giants even if it forms the south pole so that was one idea and we've got some just zoom in on that There we go, a bit better. So we've got you can see some gallic sort of hurricane shaped spiral galaxies, as it were. And then you've got this concentric layer of irrotational flow within it, right at the vortex. And, you, and it does have this lovely concentric layer of irrotational flow with galaxies forming on the outside. So thinking of fractal geometry being the cosmological principle here's the pattern of the fractal in cross-section so that was one one way of I was coming at, at it I'm thinking why uh, and seeing uh, the six lobes and the octopole map on the microwave sky we've got hexagonal formation so I'm thinking about it in that, that sort of terms because at the larger scale we're seeing this hexagonal forma formation in the microwave sky. 
But here... But here... I do... So I, you've got the jet like that. I do cross sections for the jet, so that's the concentric rings we're looking at. I do another cross section coming like that, straight through the straight through the central axis of the jet to try and think about how does this jet look in term, terms of breaking apart. So, so in thinking about the bifurcation of force, or 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 if we're going back towards the time of the Big Bang, it it's actually the unification of four forces. So here, the elect, the electro, electron and the quarks join up, coming and it becomes the electro weak, and then the electro weak joins up with the se central one. The, so why? So this one being, so this space in here being responsible. So the space that opens up is responsible for the strong nuclear force. This is the this is the weak nuclear force, and this is the, and, the, and this between here is is the outer shell, essentially gravity. So this is the gravitational field. This is this <coughs> the this forms the strong. Uh, yeah, uh, so gra gravity electromagnetic field up here this is the electron field the weak the weak nuclear field the quark field the gluon field and then the Higgs field and they all join up uh, at the time reunify at the time of the Big Bang and then down here we've got we've got a universe of antimatter Going in the doing the exact same thing, for following the laws or following the pattern of symmetry. Um, so, matter, antimatter, and that matter because for break breaks apart, and so we can get get the basic building components that form hydrogen, helium atoms, which then go on to become sun, suns and then creates all the and that and that and that whole process then goes on to create create all the other atoms on the periodic table that we find here on earth and of, of which we're composed of <coughs> and again we've got so I've got these two main pieces of art, artwork where I'm trying to describe this now Fractal geometry is a cosmological principle, and self-similar patterns repeat themselves. Even if that be in our human artwork. This is the Roman... This is, this is taken from the Arch of Titus, um, the Jewish Temple of Jerusalem. This piece of artwork here, let, let's just see. So it's almost like the. It was. Hang on a second. Is there is there a connection here? I'm. The holy artifact of the Jewish, the second Jewish temple, the Temple Menorah. Um. As as has been depicted from, and this dates from. So, this is done in AD seventy. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm thinking it kind of looks a bit like this: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sitting on a base. Well, that base is very important later on. There's a there's a whole symbology there that is just like. Well, <laughs> I want to show that because the methodology that I've used is to be looking at 
ancient symbol symbology and going and this particular piece this one particular piece that is uh, could be controversial to say the least but we'll come, come to it but yeah um, so that's my that's my fir first attempt and then, uh, then there's this whole thing about speed limits and creation of cones and thinking, does that look like a, like a the, the Lorenz cones? This is, this is an effect caused by the speed of sound. Is there something in here? So, overall, I'm, by that point, I'm summing, summing up and trying, trying, trying to, uh, it does as a beginning. Next, next one is why what, what was called Alpha White. Um, so if you if you so if I do Big Bang, if I do Hypernova instead of Kilonova, oh, you just do Kilonova. So we've got this. It was a essentially it's the name of the I it was, I gave it the title Alpha White because because that that's a project name I want wanted to give it. My the other project I've been working working on before that is a music player called Black Omega that I've been working on for years and years and years. So doing a sort of Da Vinci kind of, Da Vinci kind of thing. I kind of like, but I spent half my life on, on this particular project. I do a Da Vinci thing where, where I flip the name. And so the opposite of Omega being Alpha and beginning. So I call, call it beginning. And, and it's, and the poetic of it is, Though I did not think about it at the time, this is how, this is sort of like how it came to be. Um, because our universe is born from a rotational white hole, white beginning. And, but before that, there's a black hole, black end. And so I've got this, so I'm calling it black omega. But in reflect in reflection of, I'm figuring I'm going to be spending kind of the rest of my life doing the Big Bang killing of a hypothesis. I called it Alpha Alpha White. Um, so black hole being being the being the end, and then it gets born into a new beginning through a rotational white hole, white Alpha White. So that that's why. It's called that. Uh, I have to say, in my original film, I used a l quite a lot of. Uh, it was the. It's the phrase "Great Picasso's quote: Great artists steal." Well, I stole a lot of like copyrighted material, which the YouTube algorithm didn't really like, and. And so I put it onto uh, Bitshoot, and, and so I, I present presented my original film film that I have that I have here as okay. Here is the Big Bang hypernova hypothesis, um, from beginning beginning to end. And as I say, there. Is an approach to this where I'm using artistic interpretation on ancient some based upon ancient symbology. And in order to explore that I kinda like have to present present my beliefs, um kinda like how were they formed and and so I tell tell a bit, a bit about my life and life story and the path that le that has led me to this. So here, here I've just laid it out. So here we can see the path. 
So when I say fractal geometry is a cosmology principle and self-similar patterns, and talk about self, self-similar patterns and scale invariance, this is a co Cosh curve, which is a fractal that that repeats in itself. We just infinitely zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and it's always the same pattern, no matter how far we zoom in. And I point this pattern out in like it happens in the hypernova, long gamma ray bursts, long gamma ray bursts, and then at the same, we've got electron positron annihilations, same pattern. But in order to define the superverse, I didn't even call it the superverse at this point. I didn't even have a name for it. It took me a long, long, long time to even try and imagine it. So much my much my initial renderings of when I start saying the word superverse is a grey background. I don't know how to fill it in. But essentially it's like our universe. But exactly the same thing. Fra uh, I'm applying the logic of fractal geometry. And so I talk about the process of a, of a hyper hypernova. And th this is a beautiful uh, simulation showing jet formation. So this is actually uh, done by a, a, it's a supercomputer simulation. Um, Yes, by Philip Moster, showing showing a uh, jet formation. So uh, this is uh, essentially Sta Stanford Caltech uh, supercomputers producing this wonderful simu simulation of how the two jets just for form out. So that's like the best description of. Of what I'm trying trying of the story that I'm trying trying to tell and by the end of when this this particular simulation of the full cross sec full vertical cross section and um, so jet going that way cross section through that way that's on the left hand side and then on the right hand side the one that's still uh, play playing is a cross section through the through the supernova at this point point this one stops I think because it's reached the limits of uh, what's computationally po possible to describe the energies are just so high that it, the model blows up but we've got see we've got this sort of like curvature here it's just shaping into a bubble so it's like a balloon so when I say like so when I talk about a balloon being inflated this is a this is an actual the actual process of a hypernova or a magneto rotational core collapse supernova i use the word hypernova very specifically to talk about about supernova that are giving birth to a black hole very specifically because it's birth of a black hole that i'm that i'm trying to describe now i present this is a very, very, very tricky argument. Um, but it, it's um, how I say particles of the superverse uh, or atomic nuclei of the superverse or supermassive black holes to us is, is there are many connections like no hair theorem say, say, says um, the thing you know about black hole is its mass its angular momentum and charge. You can't know anything else about the black hole that's a result of general relativity. Whereas quantum mechanics tells you the only thing you can know about about a, about par about particle is its spin, which is its intrinsic angular momentum, its mass. And it's charge. So there's a, there's a connection there. And then there's this whole connection that's best described by EPR, 
well, uh, what's the Einstein power? Or, I can't remember what I, I used to think, it, I used to thought it was the Einstein particle Rosenberg, but it's the particular guy's name. But essentially, the, essentially you've got this thing called Bell, Bell's inequality that, that show that quantum, or where quantum entangled particles when 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 you measure one you can know know what the other, how the other one's going to be measured measured so if this is red that's going to be blue and if this is blue that one's going to be red red and and the two are connected the and they're connected at su in such a way that that if one particle was in one galaxy and the null particles in the other galaxy, and you simultaneously uh, measure the particles at each end. You so here you measure red, so you know that. So from over here, you know that one's going to be measured blue. And here we measure this one blue, hence we know that one's red. But there's this, but there's this uh, transfer of information about that between the two particles. And it's, and the only explanation really is, is via a wormhole, because this is something that's, this is a transfer of information that's happening faster than the speed of light. And so, and the ER is Einstein Rosen, Einstein Rosen bridge, which is a wormhole. And that, uh, but particularly, Particularly the ER equals EPR conjecture is a result by Leonard Susskind that that gives this full f a full mathematical description. I think within the context of uh, string theory, and, and he's saying look, that is a wormhole between the two particles, and that is if it's way of doing interstellar space travel. I think that's the key. That's going to be the key. And in fact, I present a case of. I think the evidence, as presented by the, by the U. S. By the U. S. Navy, um, particularly of the Nimitz and Cam, counter, and and others. They are showing craft that can do things that we've never seen before. Oh, we've had snapshots of pictures and people claiming these are flying so but this is like military hardware, latest radar. And in fact, it was only because they had just upgraded to the to a certain kind of new new radar on, on the F-18, I think that they managed to actually spot these things. Because these things are also act actively trying to evade us. Uh, it makes me think about Star Trek and how we, how one of our first science fiction, uh, one of our first e explorations into science fiction, Star Trek, and in there you have what do they call it? The it's a prin principle that alien life, alien other alien life doesn't interfere with the evolution of a planet's other life, so aliens will not interfere. The first prime directive, that was it. The prime directive is basically this reoccurring theme throughout all of Star Trek lore from the 1960s to, to nowadays. And many of the films kind of like just say, saying, look, we may study them, but they're not, they're not, but we're not going to uh, interfere. And the fact that they upgraded the, we upgraded our radar on the F-18 and we're suddenly seeing them and they're pulling maneuvers in such a manner that they're effectively trying to evade the radar, but the new radar system's picking up and they're going, running intercept with them. Of course, these things outfly us. It's like Mark 20 underwater. 
Well, let me introduce you to another piece of work I'm looking at. This is the tip end of the warp drive. This is a. This is. This is artificial gravity in a lab. And I'm looking at it for very, very specific reasons. Again, about again, that is something I'm going to really get into uh, into the next film. But, but actually, the way um, my and the way my hypothesis is building up, I'm I'm looking at this thing. I'm going. I know you. I know how you work. I'm I'm going to close in. I'm going to I'm going to reproduce this experiment, and I'm going to build a flying saucer. That's what I'm going to do. So yeah, welcome to the channel. <laughs> I talk about a bit about when we're going for the holy grail of physics. Yes, we'll come on to the holy grail a little bit. We'll come on to a bit. Oh my god. Here I explain how the universe is a jet. So I've done YouTube uh, video film films for each and e e e e each one of these cha each one of these chapters uh, built up the argument. I talk about this concentric ring model. Here's a computer simulation where you're seeing concentric rings in in the in the astrophysical jet jet. So again, build, building all up. And of course, I talk about fractals. What is a fractal and how to build one up? So I, I particularly look at the co cosh and then we talk about fractal dimensions and how and talk about basic pro basic bit of properties about fractals and how fractal dimensions are used, say, for like me measuring the giving description to the sea line to the coast of Britain or self similar patterns repeated irrespective of scale. And so the same pattern of, of the fractal geometry of the coastline is repeated both at the local estuary scale and at the la at the larger scale. Having having talked about fractals, I'm um, Talk about trying to identify that fractal pattern within within the universe. So that's the astrophysical jets. That's the high hypernova. Then they're trying to think about it in terms of uh, the orbital electrons of the hydrogen atom. And this is where this is probably I really haven't understood the full ramifications. Of this yet, but this is the first time where I'm like going, hang on, what's this ringularity? I thought it was also point singularity, but I learned about, but learning about new types of ringularity, i.e., the ringularity. Also, in these articles, I, I present I present new some newer data. I've updated updated the text updated the text to present figures producing more producing producing the evidence essentially so yeah I really so that film yeah really breaks it down and quite a, quite a lot of let me talk a bit about my pa past here um, and it's kind of it's kind of kind of relevant relevant but then I get into the co cosmological principle what is homogeneous what does isotropic me mean and what what is it what is it to describe something as both being homogeneous and isotropic and I put it in the co context of history um, the, the, the idea the idea of homogeneous and isotropic how how the how it sort of dates from the time of, really dates from the time of Newton, but then was given far more description than the FLWR metric and far more, but a lot of the mathematics stemming from Hilbert 
is of is isomorphic tra transformations and functional analysis is homogeneous and isotropic it underlies all the math and cosmology so so got got to describe that ba basic principle and and so what this description is is that in the fir first image we've got the early universe which is essentially homogeneous isotropic mixture of pl plasma of essentially hydrogen and he helium and uh, and over time by the lambda cdm model it uh, clumps together and clumps together over over a course of billion years so there's this period period in the land of cdm model called the dark ages and um, where and it was a time between stars first shi shining uh where the gal where the gas had to collate in, into local regions and become dense enough such that they f it formed stars and then becoming more dense such a that that driven by inflation it form forms uh, galaxies and 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 between the galaxies you've got inflation inflation of uh, dark energy so this is a lambda cdm description of of the evolution of the of the universe But then I present present the case against it, saying look if it's so homogeneous and isotropic, why are these big void voids in it? And for quite a long time in the astral <clears throat> in the in the cosmology community, this was a big problem. How did this form? And from that <clears throat> and from that inf inflation theory was born. But in inflation theory, um, it, it's like it's like the it's like the bread baking in the baking in the oven. The bubble forms inside it and pushes everything out and away from it in all equal direction. But I'm saying no, that's a star of the superverse. That's an astrophysical body that's separate from our universe. Our universe has flowed around it. And so and so this is the actual actual void that we're looking at, the lo local vo void next to the Milky Way galaxy, around which our galaxy and all the other galaxies are flowing around it. So on that point I'm like going is um I've got good reason to say that inflation is invalid but in effect in effect um in effect in effect that's what exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to do uh in, in replace inflation theory with the big bang kill never hypothesis And so that that is one of my main going to be a reoccur recurrent argument, and it's also a way of te testing it. Here I. So here here's that land of CDM mo model where, it's inflating like a soap bubble, bubble, and so it pushes it out in all e e all equal directions. So that's a a model simulation of. Of it, which is which is one of the ones that is commonly most, I've seen most reference. But here I'm also presenting a new argument. We know life exists in our universe. We're here. We're seeing other craft flying around, looking at us. And we can't explain these craft. They do things that we can't do. And I say, Let's build similar craft. But in coming up with the concept of the superverse and it being an identical copy of our universe but a much larger scale, that implies the superverse is also capable of, ha of hosting life. 
our, our university's ability to grow the fractal pattern of life. And it is the fractal pattern. Helical patterns, RNA, DNA. To grow, to grow that fractal pattern, uh, we, in, we inherit that inbuilt ability. Like we inherit all, our, all, all physics from the superverse. Fractal geometry is cosmological principle. Meaning, there's life in the superverse. So, so, I can start pointing to life outside the superverse and going, wonder what they're doing. And that's the argument I'm presenting in this chapter. Trying to present that, that vision, and it's my first attempt at trying to present that vision. For most of it, I actually talk talk about continue, continue on talking about super boys and <laughs> but I present the Kardashev scale which is which is how something that's come up in a is one description that's been formed in astrobiology about how does a civilization evolve and we're at the point of almost being a type type one and it's about in and it's about the amount of energy that we that we produce and consume. Um, so we're not quite we're not quite producing ten to the power of sixteen watts as a civilization quite yet. But then, the more a civilization grows and grows and grows, the more energy it consumes, and the more need it needs to consume energy. And so, we think about it in ter terms of terms of how much the advancement of a civilization and, and how much that civilization is able able to produce and consume en energy and so we've got type two and stepping up in power powers of ten by powers of ten we, we create create the scaling and we just and we describe uh, a type two civilization as building dyson spheres around star stars and then type three as being able to come get their energy from black holes and and essentially utilize black holes with a particular particular method called the Penrose me method of extracting energy from from a black hole. I think it's, it, and yeah, it's it's done in a, a Asimov, uh, Isaac Asimov uh, particularly laid out some of the ideas particularly in foundation and so and so i'm trying i'm trying to build up the scale to kind of like what would be a type 3 Kardashev civilization of the superverse or what would essentially be to us god well gods are always i suppose a matter of faith so i talk about my walk of faith to where I am and then I want to present uh, then then I present another chapter where where I lay out some de definitions try and talk about super verses and sub verses I'm needing to make up words and so what does my, so what do I call my star of the superverse? I call it a Maclean. Just because astrophysicists who discover things name it after themselves and I just want, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it puts a smile on my face, what can I say? I, I can't help it. I don't actually use the word. I don't actually use my definition of McLean. I don't ever say I say a star of a superverse because it's a proper and right description. Here, here's a particular image that sums up all my artwork. So that that so that bifurcation of force, and these red lines, I should say, these are very important. I'm I'm thinking of them as being 
separate arrows of time. So everything that we know and measure is this arrow of time, or on, or on this side it's this, so it's this and this. But So over here it's on one side of the universe, and over here it's on the other side of the universe, as it were. Um, but radiation is, it's immutable to our arrow of time. So I'm saying radiation occur, radiation and the cause of radiation, the reason it's immutable is because of these separate ar arrows of time. And so in cross section, I've got these six red lines. And then thinking on the blue lines, I'm thinking of what's it like to be inside a particle? What does that actually really mean? If I could be inside the electron, what is that? Trying to visualize a particle, trying to be inside it, and effectively trying to be inside inside one of these new universes that, we're, that I'm trying to describe. What is in there? Here's a space where gluons take uh, are the particle force. Here's a space where photons Here's the space of the W and Z bosons take place. And then I'm trying to present the hexag hexagonal, this hexagonal formation. And this hexagonal formation is number six. is a rather important number with in respect to intrinsic spin or particle. Fer fermions are defined as particles of half integer spin. One divided by two. Quarks which make up make up a uh, half integer spin protons and neutrons they're third they've got a third inch spin I think, can't remember which one's which one's got a third up or down as one third one third and the other one's two thirds there and and here this is a vortex vortex of sand and, and water water where I'm try, trying to show the vortex nature of this concentric system so this is really the artwork I'm, that I'm trying trying to show and so I'm just going to take a quick quick look at this again because I've been asking questions about it. so this is first the harmonic of, of the six string th Three full standing waves. This is showing six full standing waves. And it's interesting why it's blue down here, because it's blue down here. For that's very interesting. But here, here I really present my whole, whole complete argument from end to end. Before moving on to my last week. So here's where I find my artistic inspiration. And and it's because and it's because of these particular bits of artwork that I saw before I saw this uh, piece. And here's the reason for giving, giving me cause uh, as I showed in my first attempt. I don't know, this is a seven point candlestick. This is a seven point candlestick on the law on the base. But then I'm seeing the same same sort of patterns and other things. This is from Buddhist this is Tibetan cosmology. Here is it showing this jet, this concentric ring jet. And we've got this stepped base, superverse, black hole, white wormhole, white hole. Well, that's the actual symbolic representation that 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 I've come to assign, assign to it. each scale getting smaller and smaller, but we see see it in the Buddhist the the flat the uh, the unfolding of the lotus on the on the, on the Buddhist on the on this particular Buddhist site that was in Hong Kong I visited, and concentric circles, concentric circles, or concentric circles throughout history. This piece is probably the most concentric of all the circles. Now, to understand exactly what we're looking at here, I'm going to go to the go to their website. See, 
this is uh, this is the uh, oratory of Joseph, son of Caiaphas. This is the oratory of the man who sent Jesus of Christ to the cross. Take it, leave it. What I'm going to use it for my artistic inspiration. And I've just created the Big Bang Killer Nova Hypothesis. I want to present to you the Grail. Well, that's not the Grail. That's the Grail. This is the other Austria that was found in this particular temple. So these are this is the le so this is the more famous Austria. This is the lesser known Austria. But look at this piece. So open an image. So just zoom in it. We've got these six arrows. One, two, three, four, five, six. Between cornices at the top. In some ways it's a symbolic of a room it's symbolic of a room saturnine pillar where you've got helical formations coming out and it's got this separation of force or to my eyes so it starts off with this separation so gravity then then they'll the electro weak force, I think it's the yeah, electro weak force, Higgs, and then it splits up here, like splitting of the electro weak, and we've got, and so to my eye, it looks like, it looks like the artwork I just drew, but much, much better. Of course, or do you see a man's penis, or do you see a woman's uterus and womb? The duck and rabbit optical illusion contains both the masculine and feminine. I see the birth of our universe and the splitting of forces. I see, I see the formation of spiral galaxies coming forth from it. And these, these I just finished decoding. Oh my God! That's the ring. That's the ring. That gives me my way of testing quantum gravity. The power that has come from this thing. If I'm going to give anything, anything credit in this world, if I can say my eyes have looked upon something that's truly sacred, that shows the truth of this to my eyes, well, this isn't central to it. And it is what it is. This is my interpretation of it. So I've interpreted, so I've got a full description of this. And then it, become, then it becomes this. So we've got the octopole formation. So this is part of the artwork I'm going to be, draw, going, going to be drawing in this film, the, these two particular pieces. But this is the evolution of how our gal galaxy was uh, formed. And Caiaphas died and went to the cross. No, Caiaphas died, but he sent Jesus to the cross. Caiaphas was in tur turned in this. The other tomb was empty, according to Christian doctrine. <laughs> Ossuaries are unique in the fact that uh, the artwork on them, this central piece of artwork, the two seeds of life symbols on the side, that's common. But this, this part here is unique. Who could possibly draw this such that it will carry across a poo, across the span of time that it gives birth to the Big Bang Killer Nova Hypothesis. And who's connected to this piece? You're looking at the Holy Grail. You're looking at the full 
Da Vinci Code in motion now. Oh, uh, that whole Da Vinci Code. Um, here's a rather interesting way of looking at time now. How do you go about testing whether your plan's ready or not? If it's the right time, if the belief system, the zeitgeist within humanity is just ripe for an idea to bloom. I see that in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. I think someone was uh, setting off a pattern. So, well, essentially testing the water before actually before I actually went and ex executed the real thing. <laughs> of course, there's a reverse psychology that comes with uh, this piece. Uh, that that has uh, that has freaked me out more than anything I've ever 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 encountered in this world <laughs> well, okay um, it makes me very motivated to do the right thing which is I, I, what I'm doing here it makes me very motivated to do everything in my power to try and communicate the most important idea. Well, because that's how it is to me. So I learned how to do that. And as an exercise, exercise in cre creating my own graphics and own artwork and everything, I tell the story of the Big Bang, the expansion of space time next episode after that is where I present my my CPT symmetry ar argument <clears throat> and I present present uh, the context from what's called CPT Sakharov conditions and ex explain a little bit about the background but say essentially um, I present I'll leave, leave it to you to wa watch it from end, end to a end to end course it's here I actually first use the word superverse actually inventing a word is I call it superverse because our universe is a subset of that verse so to us it is we are it is our superset and so to speak so I'm using subset terminology here to say to give to give it this it's, it's it's a vernacular description, so hence I call it superverse, and an, an entrapped manifold of space-time inflating from a black hole in our universe, I call a subverse. So, making up lingo as I go. And talk about the grill I really can't open up my thoughts but I'm at this point here I'm really uh, I don't know I'm taking like a like it's some sort of joke I like trying to make a light, light of it it's, I mean it's the only thing I can do is like oh really yeah ah, 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 look at this guy fancy him he thinks he's got the holy grail Well, art, art is uh, subjective. What's not objective is a kilonova. And in a kilonova, we measure a light from it. And in measuring a light from it, and measuring a light from hypernovas, we see the signature of, atomic signature of gold. So basically, where gold comes from is from hypernovas and kilonovas. That's 
It is the rapid neutron capture process that is the alchemical process by, by which by which everything is for, by which all uh, atoms are forged. All atoms heavier than iron are for, forged in this rapid neutron capture process, and particularly gold and kilonewas and other rare elements. But it occurred to me, uh, that's not subjective. Neither is talking about the Philosopher's Stone. Philosopher's Stone is the alchemical, the alchemical substance by which ba base matter is transmuted into gold or base metals turn into gold. And a kilonova is the Philosopher's Stone. So it's a hypernova, but more specifically a kilonova. So, and that's not subjective, that's objective. And it's a particular thing I'm really going to dig into. In my, so, in presenting my new Big Bang Killer Nova Hypothesis film that we're going to be that we're going to be building together, I'm going to be talking about Grail, Philosopher's Stone, and the Big Bang and the all of creation and the patterns of creation. It's not enough just to tell the science of it. There has to be the story embedded within us because fractal geometry is the cosmological principle and this thing runs so deep that it is burnt into our subconsciouses. There's a whole swing into Jungian philosophy. Um, I think Jung, Jung particularly the way Jordan Peterson presents it, uh, I think... I think he's really on to something. I actually just carried out the execution of what they're actually looking at. After my films, I got my essays. Come COVID lockdown, I just went into ballistic mode. I knew the rules. I figured out it. Fra I knew my mantra. Fractal geometry is called That's a thing I've just been keep saying and saying and saying. And so I build it up and from there. So I start. So I start off with what is a hy hypernova? Can I break the entire pattern down, describe it in, in complete detail, every par part of it. And then from there, I also explain the CMB cold spot, why why it's formed. So these, so these essays are really, these are the from, this is the kind of like actual building up to the idea of where, where I am now. And with all my pieces, it's always, I always make sure I put in loads and lo loads of links. And then I've got my computation model, so this is how I built, built it using B Blender's physics system, so I can, can show for me essentially show the formation of a concentric universe from a from a simple physics model so this is the rendering I did did with it within the, the film I produced but then in seeing that I kind of like thought actually that makes a really good computation model that allows me to sort of describe describe it in proper mathematical terms so at the end of the day I'm trying to always go and describe it and the quicker I describe it in mathematical terms the better because that's what I'm needing need to do. It was with the understanding of the hypernova that I understood the importance of rotation. And it's this essay where I really, this is probably one of the longest essays I've done. I completely describe, I describe the, as much as I can about black hole space-time diagrams that describe on particular Penrose diagrams how how it's like a rotational vortex all the, all the effects of frame dragging break it break it down in terms of general relativity again here it's here where I'm realizing the importance of this base and the base here and the base here the symbolic base that holds everything up. Superverse, 
black hole, wormhole, white hole, giving birth to our universe. And that's a Tibetan cosmological model. Um, I mean, you know you've got the theory of everything where you could do it this way. But the, this is really... This is kind of like show, show some an, my animations of how I imagine a field being dragged in from the superverse, brought around the ringularity, and then brought and then injected out. So a lot of the artwork I'm going to be doing for for this new film is is going to be show, showing us. I mean, and in doing it, I'll be able to describe describe how how I see it. Here, I describe the formation of the Boite's void being. Of like, our un it it moves into our universe, and it create creates this void in it, and everything flows around it, or more like, flow flows around it like a liquid flow or ga gaseous flow as it is here. And then and then how it actually imprint imprints to deform to deform our universe to create create the void that now that exists and so I so yeah I've got something here that's older than our so the star in here is older than our universe but our new but the man, trap manifold space time that is our universe has flown around it again I talk about my analogies of balloons and Portions of this particular, in e each one I record, I record the experience of it, and you just have to read it because there are some very, I've seen some really weird stuff along the way. <laughs> like, does that just happen seriously? But of course, I, with everything, I make sure I back it up with as much with reference to everything I'm talking about. So, so essentially, that's my website. That's the Big Bang Kill No Hypothesis in a Nutshell. And I'll see you in the next vlog.